Friday, number 113. Eitan Blumen is coming back and he's giving us the last in a series of presentations about SSDT. The last as of now, I should say. So As of today, yeah. Eitan, welcome back to SQL Friday. Uh, the stage Thank is you, all yours. Thank you, Magnus, for having me. Um, I will go ahead and share my screen and then start a presentation. Let's see. Okay. Yay, I see the screen. Good. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Magnus. Uh, so this is troubleshooting common SSDT errors. Um, let's go ahead and go here. A bit about myself. My name is Eitan Blumin. I'm a senior consultant and DBA team leader at Madeira Data Solutions. Uh, we are the leading consulting company in Israel for uh, Microsoft Data Platform. Um, you can find me on Twitter, on LinkedIn. I have a, a personal blog post uh, where I occasionally share stuff, um, technical posts about SQL Server and Microsoft Data Platform, and also where you can find information about all of my uh, webinars, uh, the sessions that I tend to deliver, and uh, including uh, these uh, series that, I, that we'll be uh, delivering today uh, CI, about CI and CD and SSDT. Um, I also co-host the SQL Server Radio podcast together with Guy Glanzer, um, who is the CEO of Madeira Solutions. Um, what else? I'm also Microsoft Data Platform MVP uh, for a few years now, and uh, I think that's it. Okay, so about this session. Uh, so as Magnus said, this is, uh, as of today at least, it's the last fourth and last uh, webinar in the series uh, of webinars that I have on the topic of CI/CD and SSDT. Uh, first one being uh, development lifecycle basics for DBAs. Uh, the second uh, was SSDT methodologies for SQL Server DevOps. The third one was SSDT tools and features for SQL Server DevOps. Um, and um, all of those uh, were delivered already in, at SQL Friday, so the recordings are available um, as all of the recordings of SQL Friday. This uh, session is uh, we'll be discussing about uh, the next phase, as in after we we have a project and we start working with it, we start maybe trying to deploy it, and now we are encountering all kinds of errors of, that we are not sure how to deal with, um, perhaps some kind of uh, edge case or something. Um, and we'll see how to uh, troubleshoot the, the most common errors and issues that I tend to see as part of my work as a consultant on this topic. So let's go ahead and start. First of all, uh, on the agenda, I want to talk about the most important topic uh, or maybe subtopic uh, in this, uh, which is zero downtime deployment or rather development, uh, which is a, a methodology or a set of methodologies uh, that keep in mind during development and uh, planning of the deployment, the fact that the deployment is happening on a live environment, on a live database, and there are all kinds of precautions that we need to take in order to uh, reduce downtime to zero or whatever neg whatever is negligible or inconsequential to end users. We'll also discuss uh, cross database dependencies and references uh, in SSDT, and uh, we'll see a few common build issues, uh, all kinds of common problems that pr may prevent you from being able to successfully build your SQL database project. Um, we'll see a few common edge cases and how to deal with them. So replications, SQL references, uh, SQL CLR, and uh, data partitioning. Um, we also see how to troubleshoot SSDT deployments in general, um, how you would log and audit it and troubleshoot and investigate failures and such. And uh, if time allows, we'll also touch upon something that I call dynamic deployments, which is a whole topic in itself, but uh, we can go through it uh, pretty fast, I think. Okay, so zero downtime development uh, or deployment, whatever, how you want to call it. Um, 
as I said, uh, these are methodologies, uh, all kinds of precautions that we need to take in order to reduce downtime to something inconsequential. Um, the most important methodology when it comes to database deployments is essentially incremental, incremental schema changes. That's the most important thing to remember, and we'll expand on that in the next slides. And something that uh, is called feature toggles. It is a methodology common from the uh, software development world. Um, and in general, this topic of zero downtime uh, deployment uh, was discussed actually in SQL Friday uh, in a session by Alex Yates. I always recommend this session. It's a brilliant session, uh, very important in my opinion. Uh, it's like a high level overview of uh, methodologies. It doesn't uh, even take into consideration specific technology like SQL Server or SSDT, it's not relevant. It's just methodologies in general. And I want to talk a bit, just a bit, about law environments and their importance, such as uh, dev test, QA, staging, UAT, and such. Um, if you, your database, your live de production database is important, it's critical, um, its availability is important, you and downtime is uh, something that you would like to avoid. First of all, you should have a, a way to test your deployments to make sure that they work as expected, that they don't cause any, any kinds of issues uh, or unexpected uh, downtime or something that can be conceived as downtime. For example, um, locking an entire entire table, some kind of critical important table that now brings the whole system down because it's blocked. OK, that's also some kind of downtime in a way. Um, the more stages like this that you have, the more environments that you have, the more tests that you perform, the more trust you will have in your version, in your deployment method. And uh, that's why I say repetition builds trust. The more you repeat this deployment uh, um, process, the more trust you will have in it. Obviously, there are considerations to have, uh, like uh, costs and um, uh, work hours to, you know, to to construct and deploy and simulate these these uh, environments. Uh, but you know, it's it's up to the organization to decide uh, on on the priority whether it's important. They would rather risk their production database, or you know invest in lower environments to uh, have uh, low to perform tests and build trust in their processes. OK, so about incremental schema changes. Essentially, this uh, connects to a zero downtime methodology called expand and contract, uh, which is something that also Alex Yates discussed in his session, essentially uh, on a high level. Uh, we are talking about a situation where we have some kind of uh, code, application code that has a dependency, let's say, on a database object, such as a table or a column or something like that, or a stop procedure maybe, whatever. And what you would want to do is to gradually make the change of um, replacing the old object, whatever it is, with something new. But instead of replacing the, the object in a single deployment, you do it in stages. You first deploy something new, object, whether it is a column or a table, whatever, and then you gradually change all of your code dependent on this uh, old object and change it to the new one. And also, if uh, it's relevant, that you also migrate uh, the old data from the old object, whatever it is, to the new one. And once you're done, all the dependencies uh, has have been transferred or migrated to the new object, then you should feel safe enough to drop the old one. So this could be relevant, as I said, to uh, replacing columns, um, replacing tables, and that's about it. I mean, anything it could it could be relevant to anything that, that is critical and and uh, uh, especially tables uh, that contain data. Um, yeah, so that's so that's about this uh, um, point. About uh, what about columns? So 
if you add a new column, it's important uh, to add it at the end of the columns list and also make it nullable. Because if you don't, if you don't add it at the end of the columns list of a table, that means that the whole table will need to be recreated from scratch. The old data will need to be migrated from the old one to the new one. And then uh, all of the objects, dependent objects will, will need to be created, like, such as indexes, constraints, and so on. And uh, then the tables will need to be renamed to uh, basically switch places. This is something that happens behind the scenes automatically when you do such a change in SSMS. And the same thing happens with SSDT. This is a data size operation, and as such, uh, it entails very high risks, especially when the table involved is a very large table and or, and or critical table. So to avoid that, you also you always want to add new columns at the end of the list. This way, SSDT will know that all it needs to do is run alter table, add and the, the column, and that's it. Uh, it doesn't need to uh, drop or recreate or migrate anything. About nullability, so obviously if you try to add a new column it is, and it's not, then it, and the table contains data, then it will be uh, an error, right? It will show your deployment. If you add the column, and let's say it's not nullable, but you specify a default constraint, for it, then it could work be because all of the existing data will simply receive the default value that you specified. But that is a data size operation because the bigger your table, the more time it will take to uh, populate retroactively all of the existing rows in the table uh, with the new uh, um, default value. So that is a risk. You would prefer to simply add it as a null problem and do something uh, you know more online more uh, uh, controlled uh, to retroactively populate the column um, likewise for stop procedure parameters if you add a new parameter to an existing stop procedure always add it with a default value so that old code, that legacy code that depends on the same SOAP procedure it, that is not yet aware of the new parameter th so that it will not break, OK? In, in case of functions, that's a bit more complicated because you can't do the same thing for functions. Um, so the header of the function must be unchanged, and that means the list of parameters. However, you could create a new function which is similar to expand and contract, right? You instead of replacing the new one or changing the, I'm sorry, changing the old one, you add a new function with a different name, and you change all of your code dependencies to um, refer to use the new function instead with the new uh, parameters. And only when all of the references were changed and, and it's safe to drop the old one, then you drop the old one maybe in one of the next versions. Okay, you don't do all of everything that I said in the same version deployment. You, you spread it across a few deployments. Specifically in SSDT, we have a small tool that can help us in um, uh, a few things that could be very complicated otherwise, uh, called the Refactor tool. The Refactor tool, it's a built-in uh, tool in SSDT in the SQL Database project. Uh, it allows us to rename objects and columns very easily. Um, and it also uh, able to propagate this change across your whole project. So for example, if you rename a column, the refactor tool will know to propagate this change to all dependent foreign keys, indexes, top procedures, views, and so on. And it will make it very easy on you. And then uh, upon deployment, instead of let's say, um, dropping the old column and adding a new one with a new name, it will simply use SP rename. Okay, it knows to do that. Um, similarly, there's also it, it's also able to change schemas to migrate or rather transfer objects between schemas using the same tool and the same idea. However, 
um, because the refactor tool is, knows to propagate this change on all dependent objects, then you need to be you need to be mindful about those. Those could be a risk because let's say, for example, that as a, a result of changing something with the refactor tool, now you had to change an index because there is an index dependent on the object or maybe a foreign key or some kind of constraint. Uh, or maybe um, an indexed view, okay? So any change like that, that would have that sort of dependency will require, and we, we would have no choice about it, it, that there's no choice. We have to do that. It will require dropping and recreating those dependent objects. So we have to require, it will require the dropping indexes, um, dropping constraints that depend on this object that you're changing and then recreate them. And that, is a locking operation and it's a data size operation. And obviously as such, it uh, entails a lot of risk. So when you have such a situation, again, um, I'm urging you to consider expand and contract in some way, okay? It depends, I mean, each use case is different, um, but try to think about it uh, somehow to, to do something that uh, will um, follow this methodology of expanding, contracting by first adding something, migrating gradually online uh, all of the uh, dependencies to the new object uh, and the data, if uh, if uh, relevant, and then uh, drop the old one. Okay. A bit about feature toggle. So uh, feature toggle that is also uh, a methodology from the software development world. Uh, the ideas, uh, the idea is that you would have some kind of toggle in your code that would uh, control whether some kind of new feature that you have implemented will be enabled or not. And in case of SQL Server, that could be, for example, an optional parameter in a stop procedure. Uh, let's say if it's uh, on by default, then it will use a new the new code. If it's off by default, then it will use the old code and you would have uh, a way to control it, you know, make it more controlled, um, the, the deployment of this new feature. And if it causes a problem to easily turn it off and, and without uh, requiring another deployment or something, okay? Um, there is also a methodology where the toggle could be percent based or uh, it's also something called canary release where a subset of your end user of your end users will experience the new feature while most of your uh, global uh, user base in total will not actually uh, experience the new feature so it could be based on some kind of randomized uh, uniform chance like you're using a new id and checksum and such um let's say you want in in the case of uh, what you have on the screen the uh, the, uh, where's my cursor, this one. So let's say this code says that new feature enabled, this will be our feature flag. Uh, it will be on only when some kind of random number between zero and 100 is smaller than 30. So this means that only 30% of the executions will have this feature enabled. Just an example, right? It can be controlled by anything that you decide based on your requirements and uh, organization policies and based on the specific feature um, it has, but just an idea, okay? You could also control uh, feature flags using something that is data-driven. For example, a table uh, in, your, in your database that holds some kind of global parameters or uh, uh, configuration settings, stuff like that, you would have a table that would hold uh, the value uh, indicating whether this feature is enabled or not. And then if you want to turn it off and on, it's just a matter of updating a row. Um, at the bottom, you can see uh, links to uh, Martin Fowler's website where he expands on these methodologies of feature toggles and canary releases. And in general, they, it has, uh, they have a lot of information there about uh, zero downtime deployment uh, methodologies. Right, moving on. So let's talk a bit about um, cross database dependencies. What if uh, you have uh, the uh, SSDT project 
and the build is failing due to object reference errors. So usually this happens because this project that you have, this database, has a dependency on, let's say, another database. And if that is the case, you can create cross database references, which, uh, and depending on the scope, it could be like um, different database, same server, or different database, different server. Or maybe uh, you have a reference, a three part name reference, uh, which is actually a self reference, right? So let's say your database name is MyDB, and you have uh, something like MyDB dot dbo dot my table but uh, ssdp the project is not aware of what is this my db that you speak of right it's, it's like it, it doesn't recognize it so in these cases when you have self-reference like that you can use a built-in sql cmd variable called database name okay so use this dollar sign uh, and parentheses and this is a dynamic variable that whose value is determined during deployment time okay so if you deploy your project to a, a database called mydb then this will be replaced with by db and that will be in your code in in, in your actual stop procedure in database um, if uh, you deploy to mydb test then it this variable will be replaced by mydb test okay so it, it this um, built-in variable is something that changes based on the database that you deploy to. But uh, to simplify things, it's always best to simply use two part names because uh, I, I don't see a benefit to this thing. Unless it's actually dynamic. Um, sometimes you may have dependencies on system objects like uh, SP execute or uh, uh, sys dot something, whatever. Uh, and that may cause your project build to, to fail. In that case, you can still add a database reference to a system database, such as master or MSDB, and that should cover it up, right? Once you do that, uh, then it will recognize all system objects uh, and you will be able to reference them without a problem. Um, you should pay attention to compatibility level because uh, this referenced system database that you add, it's uh, compatibility level will be identical to the compa database compatibility level configured for your project. So if the compatibility level is changed at some point, that may break your system database references. Okay, and then you will simply have to uh, remove them and add them anew. So other common build issues besides object reference errors, uh, although uh, one last thing about it actually, um, they, it may also be possible that you would have some kind of legacy code that refers to uh, old objects that simply don't exist anymore and they're not in your project. So that's why the build fails. Uh, so I would assume usually that is the case, these old ob this old code is not in use at all. So just drop it, you know, or comment it out or something. Um, usually that is the case. Sometimes um, an object would be renamed and that would be something that happened, you know, long, long before. Um, uh, before you uh, created your SQL database project. So, you know, you would have to do the work and rename these references and um, either that or create maybe uh, synonyms, but I think that usually is not required, but just an, as an idea, okay? Um, sometimes there are errors related to uh, references to other databases when their either compatibility level or .NET framework version is not the same, okay? So uh, that may break the references and, and cause build errors. So, I mean, the, the solution is pretty straightforward. Just change their project properties, change the .NET framework version to be the same and database compatibility level to be the same. And uh, it's also preferable to have both projects in the same solution. That will make it much easier to maintain and work with. 
And once you have everything aligned, simply drop and recreate the database references and that should be fine. There are also a few uh, object types in SQL Server that are simply not supported. They're, they are not natively supported by SSDT, such as uh, data. Data is not something that's, that is natively supported by SSDT or SQL agent jobs or all kinds of server level objects. However, we have uh, pre-deployment and post-deployment scripts that we can use for this purpose. So uh, let's say static data and uh, SQL agent jobs, something, those are things that you can add in your post-deployment script. And as some kind of, uh, in case of data, it's uh, let's say a merge command, which you can generate very easily using this thing, Oh, okay, doesn't let me do that. Uh, which is a, a SP generate merge. It's an open source uh, stop procedure essentially uh, available in GitHub. Just look for it, and it's very easy to find. SP generate merge. Uh, it it is a stop procedure that helps you um, generate a merge command <clears throat> from an existing table in your database, and and the merge command will will contain the data itself that is currently inside the table. And then you can take this command that was generated, this merge, and paste it in your post-deployment scripts. And that will be used as, let's say, uh, versioning source control for your data. That will be relevant for static data. And when I say static data, I mean something that is version dependent, version dependent, not environment dependent, not user dependent, but only version dependent, okay? So if it's something that only changes, if the version changes of your database, your project essentially, then yeah, it's it that counts as static data. Um, that's like dimensions maybe, no, I mean not dimensions, but uh, lookup tables, uh, list of countries maybe, configurations and so on. You can also use uh, SP generate merge to create insert only commands, okay? Or uh, insert or update commands only without delete, for example, or um, and the other way around, just insert and delete, but not update. So that if, uh, let's say that would be relevant for configurations of sort that the users could change, but you don't want to overwrite on the next deployment, the next version deployment. Um, in case of SQL agent jobs, that's a bit more complicated, but not impossible. There's uh, an open source project called AZDO SQL Server DVA. Um, not very catchy, I'm sorry, it's not mine. Um, where it, it allows you to generate, I mean, a similar idea to SP and Merge, essentially, only for jobs. Okay, it generates some kind of a set of commands to basically maintain uh, the state or the source of truth, the, the, the version rather, of jobs. And then same idea, you can paste that in your post-deployment scripts and use that as your source control for your jobs. <clears throat> A few uh, additional notes about it. Um, so it's important to check for existence so that you would not, let's say, create a job that already exists or update a job that does not exist. Okay, so existence checks are important. And job owner, when you create a job in SQL Server, by default, the owner of the job is you, right? You're the, your login. So that means that if you have some kind of deployment, even if it's a automated deployment of SSDT project, and it creates a job, the owner by default will be the login that executed the deployment. If that might be a problem, then you need to take that into consideration and explicitly specify the job owner in your uh, post-deployment script. Actually, before we move into these, any any questions about uh, the things we covered so far? No questions in the chat. So I think we're good. Okay, moving on then. Let's talk a bit about a few edge cases. So these are complicated, complicated edge cases. 
but they are not impossible to do in SSDT. Uh, in case of replication, <clears throat> we have a subscriber and a publisher uh, where the same table exists in both. Our uh, desire is to only maintain a single source of truth of, of, for a table. We don't want to main, have to maintain the same table in multiple projects, right? One for the publisher database, one, one for the subscriber database. We'd like to avoid that. Uh, otherwise, we are open to user errors and things may, may, might be missed or misaligned, and that could cause a problem. So what we would want to do is somehow maintain a single source of truth. We want only a one uh, location where these replicated tables will be maintained, uh, where their code will be maintained. So there are a few ways to do that. One is to create a same database reference between the subscriber and the publisher, so that, uh, in other words, the subscriber will see, uh, air quotes, all of the objects of the publisher as if they exist inside it within the same database. That would, prefer, would, would, would help your project to be built successfully, because if you have dependencies in your subscriber on the replicated tables, it would know, yeah, sure, I know these tables. They are from the uh, this, this other publisher database, and I consider them as they are as if they are in the same database. In, in, in some cases, this could be a problem, OK, because you wouldn't really want to have a full dependency on the entire database. Um, and sometimes it could cause, let's say, a conflict if you have identically named um, objects, but those are not the replicated objects. OK, in the, in the two uh, databases. So the way to deal with that is by using some kind of uh, middle middleman, right? Some some kind of additional project where this project would have uh, these replicated objects. Okay, it will have only these replicated objects, and then um, you will take those objects out of both the publisher and the subscriber, put them only there. Okay, and you would have a same database reference both from the publisher and the subscriber to this uh, to, to this third uh, project that will hold the replicated object i know it makes it very complicated to maintain and it's very confusing and it makes the deployment complicated because because you need to take into consideration the correct order of okay which project do i do do i deploy first and where i, I know it's complicated but that is a method for your consideration another method is uh, using a, a, a feature in Visual Studio called Add as Link, which uh, you do that by adding an existing item in Visual Studio. And when you select the file that you want to add, you click on the on the carrot here, right? On the carrot here next to the Add button. And then you select Add as Link instead of Add. What this does is uh, essentially a synonym or a, a semantic link, right? Uh, where uh, you would have the same file in multiple projects, but the actual physical file will be only in one spot. Okay, so that pretty much fits the bill. That is the Visual Studio feature not specific for SSDT, what it helps you with is that essentially you do have the same table as if it's uh, duplicated, as if it's replicated in both um, projects, right? It's, it, it looks like it's as if it's, it's a duplicate, but when you edit it, you only edit one copy, okay? So no matter where, which file you open, it will open actually the same physical file. So that automatically changes that you do here are obviously done in, in both, in, in all dependent linked uh, uh, spots, locations, okay? So that is an interesting Visual Studio feature that could help you with this. Um, 
yeah, so the important thing is to maintain the single source of truth. That, that is our objective here. Um, sometimes there could be differences between uh, subscriber and the publisher object. Let's say uh, the subscriber would add additional indexes to the uh, replicated table. That is, uh, regardless of which which method you choose, that is still possible. You can create a separate, uh, let's say, index in a separate SQL file in your subscriber project. And as long as the project as a whole is aware of the existence of this replicated table, it will work okay. It will build successfully, it will be able to deploy, it will all be fine. Next issue is cyclical database references. God help me, this is a very painful subject. So there may be um, use cases where you have two databases and one has an object or objects that depend on, let's say stop procedure, that depends on tables in the other database. And the other database has the same deal. It also has stop procedures, let's say, that depend on objects in the first database. So now we have a cyclical reference. And unfortunately, this uh, um, use case is not supported in Visual Studio. You cannot, you're not allowed to add database references that cause cyclical dependency. Um, so what do we do? Ah, this is a painful subject. The idea is, uh, the most you can do here is something that is similar to what I showed um, with the replication use case. So again, it's it's a sort of a modularity here, right? So the thing with the uh, replication also was some kind of modularity. Uh, we added a third project, uh, and uh, that would hold the dependent, sorry, the objects that, on which there are dependencies. And then from the actual databases, add dependencies to the third project. Um, but it, it's the idea is the same, but I think it's actually the same in, in the reverse direction here. So what we have is the third um, project. It's very difficult to explain in words, but I'll try. Let's say we have a set of objects in DB2 that depend on DB1. Now we can add refer dependency, a database reference for one of them. So let's say we add between DB1 and DB2 so that DB1 will, will have a database reference to DB2. Okay, that should cover all the objects in DB1 that depend on DB2. What about the objects in DB2 that depend on DB1? We can take those objects, specific objects, out to a third project and that third project will have uh, a cross database reference to db1 and same database reference to db2 so that if those same objects they, they could also depend on both you know uh, say stop procedure that joins between two tables one in db1 and one in db2 so uh, we need those. This object has to depend on both, right? So in case of DB2, it will have a same database reference to one of them and a cross database reference to the other. And in this case, we do not have cyclical dependency because nothing is dependent on the third project. Okay, and it's difficult to follow, but I I hope I did I I, I did well enough. Um, and then in this case, for example, the, the, the build and, and deploy order is also important. So let's say first database that we want to build and deploy is the, is the one that is not dependent on anything else, like the root, right? So in this example, that will be DB2. That will be the first to build and deploy. And then DB1, that will be dependent on DB2 but on nothing else. So it can be the next one to be built and deployed. And then the third one, the last one will be the third project uh, who's, uh, who are called DB2 dependencies. And, and this project is dependent on both previous databases. So it will have to be last. 
to build and deploy. Questions about this slide? There are some questions in the chat. I tried to re reply to one of them, but uh, I'll read it to you anyway. Yuri is wondering, is it possible to have a cross repository database reference? So you have like, they're not in the same solution. You have another yes, database project. Yes, it is possible. Uh, you do that by uh, building uh, the, uh, the, the, the database on which you depend. You have a dependency, you build it. The result of the build is a DACPAC file. Mm. You can take this DACPAC file and add it as a, like an additional file to your dependent project. And when you add a database reference, you add the reference to the DACPAC file. Mm. Okay. And whenever like there's a new version that comes out, for uh, the uh, the main uh, referenced database, then you would have to do you know you, you would have to update the DACPAC file. It's a bit similar to how uh, NuGet packages work, if you're familiar with it. Mm -hmm. Same idea in general, like you have the uh, like the original author of the package some place over there, uh, and they publish versions of their package which are like the deck pack and you take these packages and you all only take the, like the end result, right? The, the, uh, the built, like the DLL or the deck pack file in this case, and, yeah. and add it to your project. And you can do whatever you want, add dependencies to it and, and, and build your project and deploy it and so on. Um, but uh, if the uh, auto, the original auto changes the version, it doesn't necessarily break your build because your build depends on a very specific version of this package, like a, like a snapshot in time, okay? Mm. So same idea here. So the next question is uh, from Peter. When using a lot of temporal tables, replication is not an option. Do you have any suggestions in this case? Um, that's, a, that's not, specific to SSDT, so I'm sorry I can't cover that here. We don't have enough time. No. Um, that, that's not an issue specific to SSDT. True. And last one from uh, IR. Thank you. It's useful and interesting. If different schemas or parts of one database, tables or other objects, are different teams' responsibility, is it possible to build some partial projects uh, that could be built in one at the end? Like you have well, yeah, we covered uh, we covered a few such options, um, including the you know the modular uh, projects that only contain a subset of objects. Yeah, that, as as you can see, that is possible using same database references, and um, also the same idea as the 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 previous question about uh, the separate repositories. Mm. Sure, you can have like the project the partial de project in one. A repository, they build the project, and then you take the DAC pack and add the same same database reference to the DAC pack. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. That was okay. all. The Mo moving on. Moving on. Uh, let's talk about partition functions and partition schemes. So uh, when you deploy or publish rather a database, you can go to uh, this advanced button here, uh, the advanced uh, settings uh, dialog, and there you can find uh, a few options. Ignore object placement on partition schemes, ignore partition schemes, ignore table options, and ignore table partition options. These are all options that depend on, uh, that involve partition schemes and partition functions, and they may not necessarily be version specific, right? because you have sliding windows and you have maintenance windows, uh, uh, jobs, sorry, that uh, create new new uh, partition, uh, uh, new partition ranges and maybe schemas and functions and that could be different between environments. Um, so usually you would want SSD2 to ignore them, okay? After you perform the initial deployment, uh, then you let the, the SQL Server instance manage it uh, so you wouldn't want to have SSDT overwrite 
you know everything that it is suddenly start merging partitions and you're like what, what what why is this taking so long and then partitions disappear um yeah so uh take that into consideration when you have uh partitioning these settings you could also save in published profiles which i personally love uh you can uh, create published profiles using these three uh files uh, uh, sorry you can create published profile, profile using these two files and then when you publish you can load from an existing profile using this file and these published profiles they hold all of these settings whatever you specify in this advanced publish settings dialog box you can save that as an xml file and very easily you know edit as part of your source control as part of your um, uh, deployment pipeline and, and and use that as as your set of settings for the deployment. OK, so now we reach the dynamic dynamic something. I, I forget how I called it. <laughs> dynamic deployments, I think I called it. Yeah. So we have, uh, let's say, dynamic data deployments. I, I had a few people uh, raise this issue where they want to have data as part of their source control but they don't want this data to you know it's it's not the sort of data that you can just um maintain its state using a merge command right maybe it's some kind of uh, data modification that is version specific right but it's not necessarily like the state of the whole data um let's say in version one, there was a requirement to execute some kind of stop procedure. OK, maybe this stop procedure has a set of changes, data changes, whatever. So you needed to uh, run this once and that's it just for this version. And then in version two, you, there was a requirement to update some table. To change a few settings or something and only for this version and that's it. And then on version three, there was a requirement to delete something because some kind of, uh, I don't know, whatever, uh, only for this version. So what you see on the screen is my idea for uh, maintaining data change sets, let's call it, uh, in an idempotent way in SSDT, uh, which essentially means that we uh, identify each of these um, operations with some kind of ID, right? And then we need to have uh, some place to log, some place to log which, let's call it chain set, right? Which chain sets were executed successfully? So let's say we have uh, this table called versioning or whatever, call it however you want. And then we, this would be at your in your post deployment script and it will run as part of your post deployment script and it will check okay which change set sets in in plural were not yet executed based on the information i have in, in this versioning table and this change set just go one by one and execute them and this is like a, a dynamic sql command right so whatever it is could, could be anything just execute them one by one um in order right oops sorry so like this no, like this in order based on their id right and then once you uh, complete this successfully then uh, you would update the version table to to let it know that yeah this this runs successful okay so this is just an idea okay as i said this could be as part of your post deployment script and as such, it executes only once. I mean, each change set is executed only once. It is data driven. It can affect data driven stuff or uh, logic. Um, there's a it's a very minimal requirement in terms of what kind of objects do I need to to maintain it. So basically, just one one table, okay. And rest of the data could be part of your post deployment script in your source control. It's very easy to maintain whatever is a new, whenever something new needs to be added here you just add a new row here in your uh, in your post deployment script 
and it's easy to track because you have the tracking table essentially. So that is about dynamic data deployment or even important data deployments. What about uh, something more complicated than that? OK, then uh, I'll remind you that we have SQL CMD variables in SSDT. And we can use those to implement some kind of dynamic deployment, right? So let's say I have a dynamic, uh, sorry, I have a SQL CMD variable. Uh, in this case, I called it uh, deploy jobs, OK? And it will determine whether I want to execute a post deployment script called post deployment dot jobs. Or uh, I have a SQL CMD variable called deploy change set eight, whatever it is. And only if it equals to true, only if it equals to true, then execute this script over here called post deployments change set eight. And this script could have could contain like anything essentially, right? Just be, be sure not to break the if block. OK, so don't place a uh, um, go. Otherwise, it will break your code. Um, but other than that, you can put anything you want in there. How am I on time? OK. Um, SQL CLR. OK, so. How do you work with SQL CLR in SSDT? First of all, and uh, there is this thing about the trustworthy database setting that will allow you to uh, create unsafe or uh, what's the other one? Limited? No. Yeah, limited um, uh, permission setting for your assembly. Um, don't do that. OK, that, that is an opening uh, a vulnerability which, which could be very serious. You would not want to have your database with the trustworthy flag set to on. OK, MSDB is the only one who's allowed to do that. Do not do that on user databases. Also, uh, you need to take into consideration a few uh, instance level configurations, uh, such as CLR enabled and CLR strict security. Uh, which is a new option since SQL 2019, which makes everything even more complicated. Uh, and you may want to have these options enabled before you deploy your assemblies, your CLR assemblies. How do you do that as part of your deploy as, as part of your deployment? I'll discuss this in a bit. In general, instead of the trustworthy flag, what we want to do is something that is called uh, digital module signing, okay, module signing, uh, which uh, it it is made it, essentially a few steps, okay, to do that. You need to uh, create, you need to have a master key in your master database. You need to have, uh, you can create an asymmetric key from your DLL file, okay, and the DLL file is the is something that when you build an SSDT project that contains CLR object, objects, it will generate also a DLL file, OK? So you want to uh, create a symmetric key from this DLL file in your database. Oh, I forgot to uh, put something here. Oh, damn it. And there's another step here where you, you need to sign your project, OK? You need to have your uh, project to be digitally signed. It is a built-in feature in Visual Studio. It's very easy to do, although I have not, I don't think I have time to go into that, into it right now. Um, once you do that, you have the key when you, inside the DLL file, when you build your project and you want to import that key into your database so that it will, it will recognize it as something that is trusted, okay? From that key, you create a login and to that login or user, you give the unsafe, grant unsafe or external access assembly. Oh, right, external access. That's, that's the word I forgot. And once you do that, then you will be able to deploy your assembly because SQL Server will recognize the uh, key, the public key from this assembly that you're deploying to the public key that it has already imported inside the, uh, the server. And that there, there is a matching login. It will find that it has the necessary permissions and it will allow you to do that without enabling the trustworthy database setting. 
at the bottom of the screen, bottom of the screen over here, you can see a couple of links. One link goes to the our Madeira toolbox, which is uh, an open source repository on GitHub with a bunch of scripts, including an example pre-deployment script that does the following. It, it makes sure that CLR is enabled at the instance level, and it imports uh, the uh, symmetric key from the DLL file. We need to specify the path. Uh, and and from from that it creates a login. It grants it the permissions. All all, all of these steps. Uh, it is set up very easily to use. Uh, as you know, as a template for you, as a starting point for you, use that uh, to make it easier. Also, uh, the the second link is at uh, Erland Somerskog's website. He has an extensive page specifically on this topic of module signing called Grant Perm. Uh, I recommend that you read it if you want to learn more about this topic and go a bit deeper. Let's talk a bit about how to. About it on yeah. uh, Alan had a presentation about that uh, about that article actually on SQL Friday a couple of weeks ago. It's not yet published the video, but it will come. So. Oh, cool! Nice. Thanks. So that it will also be available soon on SQL Friday. Excellent. Okay, let's talk a bit about troubleshooting. I do okay about troubleshooting SSDT deployments. So first of all, uh, when you publish, when you where is my, whoopsie, I clicked the wrong thing. So when you publish your project, uh, you can see the screen and you have this option to generate script. Okay. What the hell is going on? I ah I got stuck. Oh no. Why it doesn't it work? Okay, wow, that was weird. I, I was so suddenly I got locked into Zoomit. Okay, um, so you can uh, select this option of generate script, uh, which will perform like a, a partial deployment, right? It, it will do the uh, uh, comparison. It will generate the diff script, but it will not execute it. And then you will be able to review the script, which looks something like this and you know just as a verification validation make sure that it doesn't do something that you didn't expect the same thing can be done using command line uh, when you run sql package you give it the action called script and you can also create something that's called the deployment report which looks like this it's like an xml file which provides you a list of the uh, changes essentially that uh, would be done uh, as part of this deployment you can also control it very easily using uh, PowerShell, using the DBA tools module. They have uh, a command called publish DBA DAC package. And if you send it the parameters generate deployment report, it will create this deployment report as an XML file. And if you send it the parameter script only, it will only generate this uh, div script, it's the published script, without actually performing, doing the deployment itself. In general, when you troubleshoot SSDT deployments, I recommend uh, Shell of Waters baby steps. Start with, with small, start with local, start with manual. You know, build it gradually, your trust in this deployment methodology, in these deployment features, um, slowly and carefully, okay? Only when you feel uh, safe enough that you trust the, the process. When you deploy it locally, then uh, proceed to uh, remote deployments uh, and when you publish only when you feel safe enough when you publish it manually then you can go ahead and um, graduate to automated deployments in general there are some edge cases which could be considered abnormal where um, fighting essentially battling with SSDT uh, could have uh, could prove like uh, as a too much of an effort, and you would reach the conclusion that it's simply not worth it. That's okay. That there could be such edge cases. Okay, it's okay to use manual migration scripts as a workaround instead of SSDT. But what I would recommend that you do in such a case 
is uh, let's say step one is you do the manual deployment, okay, of this specific abnormal edge case to production or what, whichever environment it is, right? The same change you would do in SSD source control by applying, making the changes in the project so that the desired end state would be the same, okay? The end state. And then upon the next execution of the CI CD pipeline, it will see that, yeah, the end state here matches exactly the end state that I already have in my target environment. So it doesn't do anything. It doesn't make any changes. Okay. This methodology uh, is good for abnormal use cases. And uh, from experience, I know that it's very abnormal to, to be to have it necessary. But still, SSD will be ideal for common daily development. All right, so let's wrap it up. Uh, I let here are a few additional resources for you to learn more. As I mentioned earlier, Alex Yates uh, session here in SQL Friday about zero downtime database deployments, strongly recommended. There's a similar session uh, delivered by Steve Jones, um, architect in zero downtime deployments. I think he delivered it at Visual Studio Live conference. Um, I don't think there is a, a recording of it anywhere, but maybe Steve will um, deliver it again someplace else. Um, that's up to him. Uh, but it does uh, provide uh, uh, materials for his session, like the slides deck and demo scripts and so on. So those are also useful in and of itself. Um, so you can go ahead and uh, look for that. Uh, I also mentioned generate SQL merge or generate SP generate merge uh, as the open source um, store procedure to generate static data, like merge commands for static data, and also the project to generate something similar for SQL agent jobs. Um, also, go ahead and look through our Madeira toolbox in on GitHub for all kinds of um, um, scripts, useful scripts. DBA tools, very, very useful uh, module for PowerShell with a set of very cool uh, commanders that can help you with deployments. And also Microsoft has a few uh, useful resources on the topic of uh, SSDT. Uh, they have an, a whole section called Project Oriented Offline Database De Development with all kinds of best practices there. And you can also find information on the SQL package command line or if you want to install it. Uh, on some kind of remote environment to, to perform the automated deployments and so on, and information on parameters, uh, and flags and options and so on. Cool, I think that's it. Um, so um, thank you for having me. Thank you for the time. Uh, if we are not too short on time, I think we are already past our time. Uh, but if there are any other questions and Magnus is OK with going over time, <laughs> Um, no, no problem for me. Uh, no more questions in the chat, as I can see. I did paste the uh, the recording to Alex Yates' uh, presentation that you mentioned, so it's it's in the chat. The the video from right. that, uh, I really recommend it. I give it to to development teams when they think about. You know, sometimes in a big system, deployments are always going to be hard. So, and then you have the database and so on. And and I, I recommend it to to everyone to watch it because it it gives some ideas on uh, how can you uh, both think about database schema changes, uh, but also, like you say, it, it's more on a general level. The um, how, how do you enable, disable, or do canary deploy and, and stuff like that? So it's, it really gives a good overview. And then it's going to be up to you to dig deeper. So. Yeah. So no questions? Uh, no more questions. Cool. I guess that's a good sign. Or a very yeah. bad sign. I don't know. <laughs> I, I always take it as a good sign because it would be depressing to, to take it as they didn't understand. But there were some good questions though during the talk. So and I see yeah. a good one hundred percent says IR. So oh, I'll, cool. I'll trust that. I agree. Cool. Thank you.
Excellent. Awesome. So then I'll go back to learning Power BI reporting process. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and to, to anyone listening, if you are in or around Stockholm, it doesn't matter that it's good weather. It's going to be more days with good weather. So tomorrow, if, if you're close, go to Data Saturday Stockholm. It's, it's not too late to register. I really like your uh, mustache, uh, Magnus. <laughs> <laughs> it's Eurovision uh, weekend. Eurovision yeah, song. Yeah, why yes. not? Why not? <laughs> I think you look like the, this uh, Monopoly man. <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, happy birthday in uh, advance. I think you have a birthday tomorrow, isn't it so, Magnus? It's that's how it oh. is. Yeah, last oh, month it was wrong day, but this month I think I will uh, get it. So, uh -huh. and <laughs> I, I, I really appreciate I really appreciate that Daniel is organizing Data Saturday Stockholm just to celebrate my birthday tomorrow. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's <laughs> so that's kind of the caveat. If you go to Data Saturday Stockholm, you have to sing for me, but uh, th that's and not so I hard, I guess. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, see you at work then. And very yep. nice, uh, Ethan. Very nice uh, presentation and uh, very big, nice okay. tips. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kent. Thank you. I'll yeah. uh, share uh, uh, a link in the chat uh, yeah. for uh, a, a page on my site, on my website, with the, where you can also download the slide deck. Cool. That's good. So I'm and testing it right now. With that, I thank you for coming back to SQL Friday. I hope to see you again here. So you have to either do a completely different topic or develop another SSDT session for us. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to work hard on it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay. This place. So have a nice weekend, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Have a good one. Bye.